one of those handouts. So spoiler alert, it says uh, encourage one another. So that's going to be what we're talking about today. We're uh, continuing with our one another series here. And um, just so you guys know, if you're wondering how long this is going to go, we've been doing this for a number of weeks now. Uh, we're, we're taking it up to Easter, and then we're going to transition after that. So Easter's coming up here in roughly a month, and we're going to continue our one another series up till then. So anyway, I think it's been a fun study, and hopefully we've been able to put some of these things into practice in our relationships so far. Um, and this one is one that I was really uh, excited to, to dive into, and I'll, I'll share kind of why that is here as we go along. But encourage one another. Uh, let's start in our theme verse here in Hebrews chapter 3. This is one that if you've been around for any length of time, I'm sure you've heard many times. Hebrews 12, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews 3 verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And the church said, Amen. Amen. We've got to get a little bit of Southern Baptist in here sometimes. We'll, we'll work on that one. Okay, so this is a classic passage. And, you know, it ends by saying so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, sin is deceitful. Sin always overpromises and it always underdelivers. Right? It's empty. Satan tempts us in with something. So if you do this, you'll, you'll feel better. You'll, 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 things will be better. Whatever. It never delivers um, and we just end up feeling worse and more shame, and, and Satan kicks us while we're down. Sin is deceitful. And sin doesn't just go away. Like if we don't deal with it, sin has this effect where it will harden our heart. And that's what this speaks about, you know, that, that we don't get hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin has a way of hardening our hearts, just like plaque in our arteries. This is the analogy I always use. It's like plaque in our spiritual arteries that can lead to heart attack, lead to spiritual heart attack if we're not open about it, dealing with it quickly, getting in the light about it, right? So sin has this danger to it that it can harden us. This was the main issue with the, the group that the Hebrew writer was write, writing to. The author of Hebrews, we don't know who that is, but the author of Hebrews was writing to this group of people, and their, their big issue, you remember our, our series on Hebrews? That was like pre-COVID, I don't, that was like a lifetime ago sometimes it feels like, but we did the series on Hebrews, and we looked at the Hebrew group was wrestling with just this coldness, this hardening of their hearts, and it's one of the most deadly spiritual conditions there is. So the writer of Hebrews says, see to it, right? Make every effort, make absolutely sure that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. It's a tragedy when someone who has been faithful for a long time walks away from God. That's one of the saddest things. And how does that happen? It doesn't usually just happen all of a sudden. Usually it's a buildup over time of this callous, this hardness in our hearts. Satan likes to work kind of covert up slowly over time and building up this callous, building up this plaque in our arteries until our hearts become rock hard and unresponsive. And so the Hebrew writer says, don't let that happen, right? He says, the antidote, the cure, the most effective preventative treatment for a hard heart is encouragement. Yeah. And so he says, encourage one another daily. Let's define our terms. What is encouragement? Well, the, the word that we use in English has French roots. The etymology is French. It comes from en and courage, uh, meaning in and courage. Literally, it means to put courage into, right? So to encourage, uh, when you think of it that way, is it's not just like pats on the back and here I made you cookies. It's let me put courage into you so that you are more courageous to fight the battles that you're fighting. Granted, I love cookies and a pat on the back, so you know, that works too. That's part of it, putting courage into one another, helping reinstill courage for the battle. But it, you know, the Bible wasn't written in French or English. It was written in, in Greek, and the Greek word is a, or the New Testament was anyway, is parakaleo. And this is a multifaceted word. It's used in a number of different ways. But here's some of the meanings for parakaleo as it's used in the Bible. It could be to admonish or exhort. It could be to beg or entreat. When the demons begged Jesus to go into the herd of pigs, that's this word, parakaleo. Um, it's, it's please, would you, you know, would you do something? It's kind of begging. It could be to console, to comfort someone, right? So, 
Um, so it's not, we're not ruling out the plate of cookies. That is comforting. So a little bit of comfort food, a little bit of mac and cheese delivery, okay? That, that's part of this. Um, to comfort, to console, to encourage, right? To strengthen, or it can be to instruct or teach. It's used in a variety of different ways. And so um, maybe you've heard that idea of putting courage into, if you heard that one before, but sometimes it's preached like that's the real meaning. That, that is part of it, but it's, it's broader than that. There's a lot of kind of ways this word is used. Um, so it could be imbuing courage, it could be comforting. And sitting with and helping to uh, work through tragedy. So there's a number of ways this is used. We can kind of grow, though. We can, I don't know about you. I can grow desensitized to this word. If you've been around our family of churches for any amount of time, this is like the go-to word a lot of times. And this is a meme that the, the millennials will understand. But it can kind of be this like, you know, I don't know if you, have you noticed this in our church culture? How is that thing? It was encouraging. How is this? Oh, it's discouraging. You know, I'm encouraged. I'm, it's, just, we, it's almost like our, our go-to word. I don't know if, if I'm is that resonating at all. Yeah. Sometimes we overuse this. And I think what can happen is this kind of desensitizes us to the real power of this word. The real power of encouragement. And so I just feel like for me personally, um, I've been rediscovering the power of this word lately. Um, you know, for the last month or so, I've been participating in a group called, this, it's called the Ironman team. And it's not a real Ironman, and Ironman's a triathlon, uh, but this is a spiritual Ironman team. And uh, what we do is we get together, uh, it's a group of 10 of us ministers kind of around our, our family of churches, and uh, it's a paid thing, and we have to pay for it. And this coach, this brother Dave, he's kind of a, a professional coach, coaches us on how to be better at our field of work. He also does stuff for businessmen and other things, but this is the minister's group. So anyway, I'm part of this Ironman team, and uh, one of the biggest themes so far has been encouragement. He pairs us up every week. We have, to, we have a two-by-two two partner where we literally have to encourage one another daily. It's a requirement of being part of this group is, you know, literally a daily text, call, whatever, uh, to encourage each other. And we've been talking about the effect that this has in our lives. And he had us do this, this exercise. So I paid for this coaching exercise, but I'm giving it to you for free of charge right now. So you're welcome. You're welcome. So he had us do this. He said, list the top five responsibilities in your life right now. Okay, so I just want you to think about that for a moment. If you've got notes, you can jot down a few things. What are some of like, the top five? Don't press yourself like, is this really? It should be God. Okay, just put whatever comes to mind. Your top five responsibilities. For us, we are a group of ministers. So they're pretty similar things. We talked about our own personal walk with God, taking care of our families, right? And then preaching the word, shepherding people, all these different things. So take a moment, think of it for you. If you've got a few in your mind, that's good. If you've got one or two, it's fine. But then he asked us this question. He said, how are those things different when you do them courageously? Like when you do these things and you're like confident, you're secure in God, you feel strong, you feel courageous, you're just kind of bubbling over with like, yeah, God's got this, God is with me, right? You're feeling secure in, in God and who you are. How does that affect those doing, how you do those five things? It was really a profound exercise for our little ministers group. Now, I think about for myself, when I do a Bible study, for example, or I have a time of a mentoring time with, with a brother, I'm way more passionate. I'm way more loving. I'm warmer. I'm more courageous to, to maybe challenge sin or say the hard thing. I feel joyful and close to God as I share his message, right? Versus when I'm discouraged, I'm much less warm. I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more passive, there's maybe something in my mind I think I should say, but I don't go there because I don't want to, I just don't want to even bring it up or open that can of worms. Like, I, and I'm just not as, I don't have the same joy levels. Like, it just, it really affects how I go, or even my parenting, like the type of parent I am, the type of husband I am. Like, for you, when you are filled to the brim with courage, how does that change how you do these things? What kind of person walks through the door of your workplace? When you're full of courage. What kind of person walks through the door of your class? What kind of parent or student or employee or friend or roommate or spouse do you become when you're filled to the brim with courage? You know, one of the brothers in the group 
uh, this guy Tom, he leads a church in Milwaukee. He says, or I think Madison, I'm sorry, Madison, Wisconsin. He goes, he just was honest. He's like, I'm just not in the habit of evaluating whether I'm encouraged or not. Right? He's just like, I just kind of do what I have to do, kind of regardless. I have my responsibilities. I just do what I need to do. He's like, I don't really spend time evaluating. Well, am, am I encouraged this week or not? And I think we can treat it like that. Like, we can start thinking that encouragement is kind of like this luxury. It's like, okay, life's hard, and it's kind of just discouraging. And if you're encouraged every now and then, great, but don't expect it. Does that resonate with anyone? That's how I feel a lot of times. But I think what we need to do is start taking this command in Hebrews 3 more seriously and go, no, like I'm not going to settle for a discouraged body of Christ. We have so much reason to have joy and to have courage. And so as far as it depends on me, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let my fellow Christians be discouraged. I'm going to encourage you guys daily. I'm going to find some way to console, comfort, strengthen, or put courage into my fellow brothers and sisters. I want people to walk away from encounters with me feeling like my courage tank is more full than when I walked in. And not that it's about me, but that, that maybe there was some scripture shared or something that God worked through it that you walk away feeling like I am more courageous now than I was before. And imagine if we all had that mindset. If we all committed ourselves to go, I'm going to be an agent of courage and encouragement of my brothers and sisters. What kind of culture would that create? If we didn't treat encouragement as this luxury they have every now and then, but we go, no, we're going to make sure everyone's feeling encouraged. I'm not saying that that's entirely absent. I think we're pretty good encouragers in a lot of ways, but I do think we have room to grow. And so how can we as a church genuinely encourage one another all the time? That's the question. What I want to do is just spend the rest of our time doing a little survey here of what encouragement looks like throughout the Bible and just let that let the spirit kind of jog some ideas here. And whatever hits you, maybe that's where you star, take away, take notes on. But I just kind of want to do a, a, a survey here through the Bible and look at this with some fresh eyes. Does that sound good? So I put the scriptures there on your, on your thing. I'm going to kind of fly through these. I'm going to try to fly through them. Um, and we'll look at kind of what this looks like throughout the Bible. You know, if you start in the Old Testament, the first appearance of the word encouragement is in Deuteronomy chapter 1. In Deuteronomy 1, 38, God tells Moses that Moses will not enter the promised land, but your assistant Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him. Because he will lead Israel to inherit it. This is the first occurrence of the word. Uh, you know, Joshua was the younger leader, right, who was going to succeed uh, Moses and who would lead Israel into the promised land and do battle with the inhabitants of the promised land. I mean, that was terrifying. I mean, imagine, imagine you're in Joshua's shoes. Lots of unknowns. High expectations. The weight of a nation upon your shoulders. I mean, he needed encouragement. And I think about for us, do we encourage our young people to rise up and lead? Do we encourage people who are standing at the border of a new chapter in their lives? Students who are graduating, parents with new children, right? There's all the time, all the time there's people kind of on the precipice of an unknown, on the precipice of a new chapter in life. Are we standing next to them, encouraging them to go in courageously, <laughs> Another example is the next in Judges chapter 7. This is Gideon. In Judges 7 verse 9, it says, During that night the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. I love this. You know, God has this patience with Gideon that he really needed. Like, Gideon begins the story as like this weak nobody. But I think God knew that he could be a somebody with a little bit of encouragement. And so God is patient and he really helps Gideon to, to build up the courage that he needs. He's like, hey, go down to the camp, listen in on a conversation. And then just, if you know the story, they happen to have this conversation. The guy's like, I had a dream that this you know, loaf of bread came tumbling through the camp. And, and the other guy's like, well, that's surely Gideon. And he's like, what? That's how'd you get that out of the loaf of bread? He's like, surely that's Gideon. And, and they're going to come and outrun us, right? And, and Gideon's like, yes, you know, we're going to win. And so he, goes, he gets the courage, right? But I think about just the, the patience, right? Do we 
Are we patient in helping each other build up our courage? Maybe you go, my brother or sister should be doing more, but are we patient? Are we helping to build them up so they can do more? Are we the kind of people who are instilling courage in them um, so they can win the battles that they are facing? Are we patient with one another in that? I think about Judges 20. If you go back a little bit later in Judges, uh, this is a dark time in Israel's history. This is, they're actually in the midst of a civil war. It's the Israelites versus the Benjamites. But in Judges 20, 21, the Benjamites came out of Gibeah, cut down 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. But the Israelites encouraged one another and again took up their positions where they had stationed themselves the first day. So there's this big defeat. Right? 22,000 troops go down. Um, friends, relatives are fallen on the battlefield. But they encouraged one another, and they took up their positions again. I think for us, we need to encourage each other when we fall. Right? Your encouragement could be the difference between someone getting up and continuing to fight versus someone throwing in the towel and saying, I'm done. Right? The difference maker could be the encouragement that you give to help someone get back up, keep fighting. Maybe they're in this fight against sin in their lives, that, that, that Satan is trying to drag their soul away, and they need your encouragement to get up and keep fighting, even after they fall. It could be a variety of battles, right? But are we encouraging each other, even after defeats, to get up and keep fighting? Uh, in 2 Chronicles 30, Fast forwarding uh, a lot later in the story of Israel, uh, this is King Hezekiah. It says, Hezekiah spoke encouragingly to all the Levites who showed good understanding at the service of the Lord. This is a time of major reform. The previous king, Hezekiah's dad, King Ahaz, had, was totally corrupt. Uh, Hezekiah fears God, though. And Hezekiah attains the throne, and he's trying to bring out some major reform to get back to worshiping God, to get back to the temple worship that God had instituted. And so... He's bringing back the Passover, all this stuff. And the Levites, right? What do we know about the Levites? They're the tribe in charge of the temple. The, they don't have any inheritance. If you look on your map, there's no Levite, land of the Levites. Their inheritance was the work at the temple. And the Levites hadn't done this in a long time. It had been a long time since they had, you know, how do you prepare the sacrifice? How do you, what are the proper uh, procedures for that according to God's word. Well, the Levites apparently knew what they were doing, and it says that Hezekiah speaks encouraging to them because they show good understanding. They've been studying their Bibles. Um, but I think what, what King Hezekiah does, which I think is the mark of a good leader, is he recognizes competence and points it out. Um, that's one way we can encourage each other. Do we acknowledge competence when you see it? Do you point out when someone does something well? Because a lot of times we assume, oh, they know they're doing well. Especially when it's a regular thing, like worship team gets up here every week and they sound really good, right? And, and it's just a regular thing we're used to. But like, do we go, you're doing a great job, you know, or, or whatever it might be. You know, my wife does, gets all the stains out of my shirts and I just go, she does that every week because every week I have fresh stains on my shirt, right? I'm like, man, she does such a good job. Like, do we acknowledge when people do things well? I saw this quote the other day. Um, which I thought was really profound. He says, everything we say at funerals should be said at birthday parties instead. He says, we leave so much love unspoken. Now, I think if, you're, if you've been part of our church for a while, we're, we're, I think we're pretty good at birthdays, I've got to be honest. We, we share and we encourage and we lift up. But generally, the principle is true. There's so many things that we, maybe we assume people know. But, man, we need to voice those things, the things that we appreciate, the things that we see people doing well. You know, when someone does something admirable, do we, do we voice it? It takes a little bit of courage on your own part, right? It takes a little bit of courage to say, hey, man, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate this about you. Do we vocalize those things? Do we not just, so many times we just think them, but they need to become words that get to them. Amen? Later on, another one, Second Chronicles 32. If we continue on your hand out there. And... Um, 2 Chronicles 32, again, this is King Hezekiah. And the king of Assyria, King Sennacherib, is now attacking Jerusalem. Assyria is this big military powerhouse. It's really intimidating. So here's what Hezekiah does. It says, he appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him at, in the square at the city gate and encouraged them with these words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. 
because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah the king of Judah said. I love this. You know, here Hezekiah encourages the people by doing what? By pointing them to God. Right? I love how he says, it, he says that they've only got the arm of flesh. We've got God on our side to help us and fight our battles. And I love how at the end it says, and the people gained confidence. Isn't that awesome? The people are like, yeah, God's with us. Like they just get this confidence. When your fellow Christian is in a battle, it's one thing to say, you're great, bro. You can do this. It's a whole nother thing to say, God is great and he can do this. Right? And sometimes we need to hear that. Like, brother, you have what it takes. Like, sometimes we need to hear that. But do we, do we go even further and go, and also, God is, is with you. God is on your side. God can do this despite our failures, despite our weakness. God can do it. We need to point each other to God. Amen? Amen. If we jump into the New Testament, if we kind of turn the large page into the New Testament, um, there's so many examples. I really had to trim out some. I know I've got a lot of scriptures on that paper, but um, one of the first occurrences is actually referring to this guy, Barnabas. And uh, in Acts chapter 4, uh, we have this guy named Barnabas. His original name was Joseph. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means what? Son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. Sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Okay, it's not totally clear how Barnabas got this moniker. They call him the son of encouragement. But you look at his life and you kind of get some clues as to why maybe they called him the son of encouragement. Right here in verse 37, it says that he sells a field. So here's a guy who's willing to sacrifice for the needs of his fellow brothers and sisters. Uh, financial sacrifice can be a way of encouraging people. But I think also what Barnabas did is he welcomed the outsider. We see that with, 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 uh, with Saul becoming Paul in Acts chapter 9, the next, next passage there in your handout. In Acts 9, this is, you know, Saul, right, persecuting the church, totally just, you know, a, a terror to the New Testament church, becomes a Christian in this incredible act of God, totally turns his life around. And in Acts chapter 9, um, it says, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. I love that, right? Like, Paul shows up, and they're like, that, there's no way that guy's a Christian. <laughs> no one trusts him. They're like, we can't trust this guy. And Barnabas is the one guy who goes and says, come on, Paul. Like, come on, guys. You can trust this guy. And he welcomes the outsider. Do we welcome the outsider? When there's someone new at church, do you kind of eye them out of the corner of your eye? Like, who's that person? Or do you go up and engage? Do you introduce yourself? Do you welcome them? Okay, they're not here right now. We had like five Mormons here pretty regularly. Did you eye them? Like, what are they doing here? Or did you go up and like welcome them and love them? Amen. Right? Do we welcome the outsider? You know, to be honest, I think we've gotten a little bit, a little bit cold after COVID. No pun intended. We've gotten a little, just a little bit. We're still warm. I think we're a warm group. But we've gotten a little bit cold. I've noticed that the amount of hugs has gone down a little bit. There's a little bit more like, hey, there's a little bit more fist bumps. And I've propagated that myself. I'm a fist bumper. But, man, little, like, simple things like giving a hug actually do a lot to create a, a culture of warmth and welcome. And let's get back to that, guys. Um, let's get back to greeting one another. The Bible says greet one another with a holy kiss. So here's what I'd like us to do. <laughs> Don't do that. Now, that, that, was a, that was a cultural thing, right? That was normal in their time in that part of the world. Um, but I think for us, you know, giving a warm hug, right? Um, greeting one another when, when we come in. I think let's, let's really make sure we're doing that, guys. That we're being warm to each other and encouraging each other, even in simple things like that. Come on, Max. Awesome. Next passage, in Acts 14. This concept in this passage comes up a lot. This is one of the places it shows up. In Acts 14, 21, it says, Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. 
So this is after the, Paul's gone through on this mission team, planted a bunch of churches, and then they go back through visiting all these people that they've helped become Christians to encourage them. And to encourage them specifically to remain true to the faith. And really, this is a huge part, if not the reason, why we encourage each other, right? Is to help each other stay the course with Jesus. Amen. That's really what it's about, is to help each other remain true to the faith, to not give up, to stay faithful. And part of that, he go, it's interesting, it's like they're encouraging them, and then it tells you what the message was. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Like in this case, the, the message of encouragement wasn't like, it's all going to be good. and we're, you know, It was like, life's going to be hard. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world, right? Part of that is just acknowledging when things are tough, but pointing each other, like we said, back to God to stay faithful, to stay the course. Amen? A couple more, guys. Just, you hanging in there? I know this is a lot of verses. Yeah. Hanging in there? Okay, a couple more. Acts 18. Acts 18, 27. This is Apollos. I love Apollos. He's the man. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia... He's a recent kind of a recent uh, convert. Wants to go to Achaia, this this other region. It says the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who, by grace, had believed. So Apollos, this new brother, he wants to go to this place. He has this vision. I want to go to Achaia. You know, and you notice what was the response to that? They weren't like, "Well, you're kind of young in your faith. You really should stay here." And you know, you really, you know, slow down, brother. They didn't do that. They're like, awesome. You want to go? You can go. Like they, and it says they wrote a letter there. They're like, you know, they send him along with a blessing. They write this letter to, to, for them to welcome him. And, and it says that he was a great help to them. You know, when people have a vision for some way they can serve, do we empower them to do it? You know, I'm so proud of you guys. I remember a few years ago, you remember when Cordell wanted to go to Papua New Guinea? I'm sorry, Tanya. It was like during Christmas. That was like, that was, that was a bad time. But I'm really proud of how, you know, some of you guys really stepped up and gave to that for him to fly across the world and, ha- and serve these people across the world. And, uh, and now he's, you know, serving in Fort Collins and just doing a great job. But, um, you know, here's a brother who had a vision. He wanted to go serve in some way. And I'm really proud of this church for stepping up to help make that happen. You know, but I think about when, when I know Cody want, is graduating soon. Cody wants to go into the ministry. Are we going to help make that happen as, his, as the body of Christ around him? You know, whatever that look, I don't know what that's going to look like. Are we willing to sacrifice maybe financially or something to help that happen? You know, not just people going to the ministry, but if there's someone in your family group that goes, I'd like to serve in this way or that way, do we go, awesome, how can I help you, right? How can I come alongside and empower you in this vision? Okay, next one, encouragement from God. Romans uh, 15, it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures... And the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. You know, it says that one of the reasons we have the scriptures is to provide two things. What are they? Endurance and encouragement. Of all the things, you go, what is the scripture? What are the scripture for? It's, it's a lot of things. But to provide encouragement and endurance. If you need encouragement, go to the Word of God. If you're going to encourage your brother or your sister, use the word of God. I think we understand this, right? But I just, I just think it's cool that the Bible even itself acknowledges the scriptures are here to encourage. Use them to encourage. Whether it's you know, sharing in person, texting a verse, whatever, God's word is powerful to imbue courage and comfort. Um, okay, two more. 2 Corinthians 13. Uh, this is Paul's letter to, or this is likely Paul's fourth letter to the Corinthians. First and second Corinthians is, is likely actually second and fourth Corinthians in terms of the letters. There's probably a number more letters that we don't have. Um, the Corinthian church was kind of messed up. We needed a lot of emails from Paul. Um, second Corinthians 13 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. You know, the Corinthian church was, was dysfunctional, to say the least. All kinds of division, people worship, just blatant sin. And so Paul really calls them to repentance. If you read in 1 Corinthians, there's a strong call to repentance. But now by the time we get to 2 Corinthians, uh, we get the impression that things are changing. That they're beginning to really repent. 
But there's still room to grow. There's still more to go. And Paul ends by saying, look, don't stop. She says, strive for full restoration. Keep going. Keep trying to change. I know it's hard. Encourage one another. And so I think this is important for us to acknowledge. Like, repentance is hard work. Like, changing isn't easy, right? And so Paul knew that they would need to encourage each other along the way. Encouragement does not mean just, like, patting each other on the back and ignoring sin. It's not what encouragement is. It's not just, you're doing great, and just turning a blind eye to things that need to change. Encouragement um, is helping each other to really believe we can change, right? Sometimes we lose the hope. We, we stop believing we can ever be different. You ever had that where you're like, you set a goal and you fail, you set a goal and you fail, you set a goal and you fail, and you go, well, I'm done with this. I, this is never going to change. Well, we need one another to reignite that hope. You go, no, you can. God can can like, God is with you. Things can be different. We need to be renewers of hope for each other. Help each other to continue to repent and change. Last one is 1 Thessalonians 4. And this is the hope of resurrection. I'm going to read this whole paragraph. You don't have the whole paragraph on your handout. Um, but I'm going to read the whole thing. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring Jesus, will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, whatever that means. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the classic kind of picture of like what we might call the rapture, uh, the resurrection. But it's interesting that Paul says, encourage one another with these words. Now, it begs the question, and this is my last verse, and we'll, we'll close out here, but it begs the question, how do we share this type of thing with each other without coming across, like, really cheesy? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, well, you know what, Nick? The Lord himself will come down for he from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And he's like, okay. <laughs> you know, like, you, let's be honest, none of you have said that this week, Right? Okay, so how do we share this type of stuff? Like Paul says, encourage one another with these words. What does that mean? Um, I know for me, and I'll just share what my experience here. A lot of my times with people um, are often pointing people back to the bigger picture of what God is doing. And so someone will share some hardship or what the, whatever they're going through. And I take some time, I try to take time to listen and, and empathize. But when it comes time to respond, a lot of times what I try to do is ask things like, what do you feel like God is doing in all this? What do you feel like God is teaching you in all this? How do you see God at work? Like, I'm trying to help them get out of, like, the zoomed-in picture and go, what is God, what's, how are you part of the bigger story here? And to remind people, to remind each other, I think this is what we need to do, remind each other of kind of these spiritual realities beyond our present situation, in whatever kind of verbal form that actually takes, right? But, but helping each other to have hope that there's more than just what you're going through right now, that there's more beyond this life, that we actually have hope because of Jesus, hope of resurrection um, beyond our current hardship. Man, thank God that we have hope beyond this life. You know, even if, if, if you're like, how do I encourage people? You know, if even it's like the darkest of situations, like we always have that as Christians. You just go, no matter what may come, we have this hope of of eternal glory with God, unending joy, where every, every tear is wiped away. There's no more pain or crying or sickness or sin. You just go, gosh, what a kind of hope we have. And so if you have like no idea how to encourage, you at least have that one, no matter what the situation is. So thank God for the hope that we have because of Jesus. So that's a survey. It wasn't everything, but is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of dimensions. This takes a lot of forms throughout the Bible. There's a lot of ways to encourage. So if there's something that struck you, you go, ooh, that's the one I, I think I need for my brother over here, or my sister over here. Star it, take a note, whatever you need to do. But let's be the kind of people that instill courage and comfort for each other. Amen? Amen. Amen.
Here's the practice for the week. Here's the challenge. Choose someone in your family group, preferably the same gender, and practice daily encouragement. So I mentioned that in my Ironman team, we have these two-by-two two partners, and literally it's a requirement. You know, that every day, it's some kind of text, some kind of call. I just sent a brother a book on Amazon because he was kind of talking about some things he's wrestling with. I was like, this would encourage him. So just, you know, find someone and just practice it. I challenge you to do this because I don't think, when's the last time you intentionally, every day for seven days, were like, I'm gonna encourage this one person. I'm just going to be this like conduit of encouragement into their heart. I want to challenge you to do that. Before you even leave here today, tap someone, whoever that is, say, let's encourage each other. And I think the way to do it is to ask what would encourage you. Don't just assume. Everyone's encouraged kind of differently, right? Andrea Myers Briggs, she knows. So um, I'm sorry, I said your name, Andrea. Um, She's trained Myers Briggs. So everyone is, has different, like, kind of different love languages, different personality types. Ask them what would encourage you. Maybe it's a text, maybe it's a phone call, uh, maybe it's sharing scripture, maybe it's words of affirmation, right? Like we talked about, acknowledging competence. Maybe it's accountability. They're trying to really change something. You go, I'll hold you accountable. I'll ask how it's going each day, right? Just ask what would encourage you and then do it. Um, practically, you know, I, I think Marco Polo is a great app, but you choose what you want to do. That's like a walkie-talkie app. I think works great. But um, does that sound good? You willing to try that? Yes. Okay, let's do it. Let's be encouragers. I'm going to go ahead and pray for our communion, and then uh, we'll continue with our service. Well, Heavenly Father, we're just grateful that you are such an encourager to us. And we're grateful that you've given us your word to encourage us. And that at any time, we just need only think of the cross, the resurrection, the life to come. And we can just have fresh courage. God, I'm just so grateful for your son. I'm so grateful for the cross. Thank you for washing away every sin and just giving us a hope beyond this life, God. Um, help us, Lord to practice what you command us to do, to encourage one another daily. And Father, I pray that no one in this group or even outside these walls who's not here today, I pray that no one would have a hard heart that turns away from you. Uh, Father, that we would just be the kind of people that say, far be it from me, that, uh, that we will encourage each other. Uh, God, give us resolve. I know it's hard to do things um, habitually when they're not yet a habit. And so, Lord, please with the power of your Holy Spirit, remind us, lay it upon our hearts. Uh, Father, help us to practice being selfless in this way with each other. Father, we love you. We just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll have the communion come around at this time, and uh, we'll continue with our service.